Hey, what's up guys? Matt here coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. So today we're going to be talking about the brand new 2024 model year, Lowrider S. I'm here with Nick Culver once again. And we're going to be discussing pretty much every topic we can think of that kind of surrounds the Lowrider S. So this year, they shipped out some of the bikes early, uh, mostly Softails and Trikes, I think are the only bikes they're gonna ship prior to January when the new model year typically launches. And there's not a whole lot online right now on Harley Davidson's website in terms of you know specs and pictures and things like that of the bike. But you know at a first glance, uh, the bike looks mechanically pretty much the same, which I think is part of the reason why Harley Davidson had no problem launching the bike and sending it out to dealerships prior to the official launch, which is gonna happen next year in January sometime. And so we took a look at it. Uh, one thing that was a little bit different, they switched up a little bit, is the base color this year. So the base color this year is actually called Billiard Gray. It was a color that we did see in the 23 model year. Uh, it was on a couple different two tones uh, with the blue as well. But it looks, at first glance, some people are saying, okay, it looks kind of like the gunship gray, but it definitely is a lighter shade of gray than the gunship gray. But what I mean by base color is this, this is now the new color that you can get without an incremental cost to the MSRP. Historically, Harley Davidson has always had vivid black as their base color where you don't pay an upcharge for the vivid black. That's no longer the case. Now it's billiard gray. So if you want vivid black, you're gonna be paying a $350 upcharge for vivid black if you wanna get that instead of this billiard gray. The billiard gray is gonna be the base color for all the models. And that upcharge for black is I think gonna vary depending on models, you know, the touring bikes, it will probably be more just because there's more surface area to paint. But there's also other solids and then there's another tier called premium color. So for a solid other than the billiard gray, I think it's 525. And then for a premium solid or a premium color, I believe it's like $650 for the Lowrider S. Again, those prices are going to change a little bit based on what model we're talking about, but this is the Lowrider S. So I think initially, you know, when I thought when I saw this, when I heard about this, it was like, okay, this is a creative way for Harley Davidson to make more money. And I think a lot of people are going to probably think that initially. That was my initial thought. But I try to look at the positives as well. You know, for one, if you want billiard gray this model year, which is actually a really nice color, you don't have to pay enough charge for that color. So the people that want that color, it's, it's, a, it's a positive, right? Another thing is we see a lot of black Harley Davidsons. And this is probably just for industry people that are kind of getting tired of seeing the same black bike over and over, especially a Lowrider S. There's just a lot of black Lowrider S's out there. So it's nice to now have a color that you don't have to pay more for you pay less in, in this circumstance. And so you, we may get more bikes out in the wild that aren't vivid black. And you know, this is something that's been done by other companies as well. Like you look at like Tesla, the base color is white and you actually pay an upcharge for black as well. So Harley Davidson is not the first company to do this. So it's not all bad in my opinion. I guess if you are a guy that buys black, you know, you're, you're not paying a little bit more money for your bike. Yeah, it's, um, you know, part of the problem in that, uh, you know, my 18 low rider that uh, we blacked out all of the, the chrome was also a black bike, although I didn't really have choice on that one because it was kind of already in the process of being built when I decided to buy that. But yeah, I kind of, I feel the same way. I just see too many black bikes. So, and 350 bucks, at least on this particular model is not amazing to have to pay extra for something that last year you didn't have to pay extra for. But on the flip side, you know, I, I, I always had to... Yeah, you know, I always had to explain to customers too that, you know, okay, you're buying this solid color gray. You have to pay $450 extra. Why? I don't know. Um, I think the gray is actually easier for Harley to paint. Like usually quality control on black, like the justification for charging more is it's more expensive because any kind of imperfection on a, on a very, very dark color with no uh, pearl in it is going to, it's going to show up. Right. So I've, I've always heard, and I'm not a painter, so maybe a painter can correct me, that the prep work on black is is the worst. So I understand why like a company like Chevrolet, who's making a billion trucks, right, wants to paint all their work trucks white because it's like the easiest color to hide any kind of imperfection. So, you know, I could understand charging a premium from that standpoint. As you mentioned, like the downside of this is that, well, when you make this change, it's going to always seem, at least initially, as kind of arbitrary and just kind of a cash grab. But, you know, uh, there's worse ways to increase the MSRP. You could just increase it across the board. And like you said, for um, customers, who are interested in the gray and the gray is a really nice color so yeah it's nice you know uh i think a lot of customers were sad when the solid gunship gray and the solid grays went away and while this isn't exactly like the gunship it's very very similar and so if you felt like you missed an opportunity to get a gunship bike here's your opportunity and you're going to get it at uh, a, a lower price because you're not paying the premium paint so it's, it's similar but different you know which is good too because yeah. you know the last thing we want to do is release gunship gray into the wild again and, yeah you know start that whole thing uh, with uh, the complainers yeah. again but yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, speaking of MSRP, you know, you brought up a, a topic there, Nick. So something that's that's I think is a very good thing that's happened this year as well is we have done away with the surcharge. In the past couple of years, you know, surcharge was introduced in the 21 model year during COVID when uh, there was a big spike, you know, inflation was going rampant. There was supply chain issue things and Harley Davidson kind of made a quick reaction to add a surcharge just to kind of cover the increased costs of raw materials. So we've seen that now through the 23 model year. Now in the 24 model year, surcharge has been eliminated. Another thing is ABS is standard on some of these soft tails that previous model years has been a, an option, a factory option for $950, Lowrider S being one of those. The MSRP did go up this year, but if you factor in the surcharge and you factor in the ABS now being standard, and you also, you know, last year they introduced the traction control for $200. This year, I believe it's standard as well, although that's a little bit unclear at this point. But if you factor in those things and you compare it to a black Lowrider S last year and you compare it, that to a billiard gray Lowrider S this year, uh, the price went up $100. So you know, you're pretty much no increase in price in the 24 model year, which I think is a, a good thing that a lot of people are going to be happy about. I think that if traction control does turn out to be standard and just included in the MSRP that, that we know, it might actually be a hundred bucks cheaper, right? And then if it's not standard, I think it's a hundred bucks more. So I'd, I'd have to do the math again, but yeah. it's, it's pretty much a wash when yeah. you're spending $20,000. It's certainly less than whatever the inflation was between those two uh, model between the two right. model years. So, um, yeah, it's, it's as near as makes no difference, the same price, um, fundamentally. So overall I'd say that's, that's mostly a win. And then in addition to it, not really changing a price, like I really just appreciate the transparency on the customer side of things. You know, uh, yeah. the unfortunate reality is that our website pricing has to kind of mirror Harley's website pricing when it comes to MSRP and it's not until you scroll down to the pricing tab on Harley's website that you can see the full breakdown of the price. And then that's where you get to see freight and you get to see California emissions. And this is all stuff that's on Harley's corporate website. But Surcharge and ABS. Exactly. You know, all these fees that got tacked onto the MSRP. Yeah. And so we've always had our website match Harley's MSRP, but with the addition of surcharge and then the, the the backpedaling of certain things that used to be standard and that are now optional, like ABS, because especially towards the end of the last model year and, and most of last model year, even though ABS was technically optional, I, I don't think we got any low rider S's that didn't have ABS. Very and so, yeah. so customers would come in and the, the differential between MSRP and the actual retail price of the vehicle was more significant than it really needed to be because of the optional ABS and Harley's surcharge. And then also they had also increased freight and a couple other fees. So I'm glad that that, that gap is now going to be much, much lower because mm -hmm. really the only things are going to be the, the stuff that has always historically been there, which is like the freight and the California emissions. Uh, it's just gonna be a lot more transparent for customers on pricing. And you know, with how we do business, that's what I prefer because it, it just makes it a lot easier for customers to understand what it is that they're paying ultimately and it just makes it easier for them to to make buying decisions you yeah know? people and don't like surprises once exactly. they show up to the dealership no and we don't like it either because it just right. makes it sound like you know we're trying to hide things or we're trying to you know it's just it's not a game that we are interested in playing we have a very transparent pricing structure as we've talked about a million times um and it's a part of why customers really really like us but on the flip side if we're not the ones obscuring or or making the pricing more convoluted than it needs to be then we're ended up having to explain weird things, you know, like I, I remember first when surcharge came out, it was just a big, like, I thought you guys don't do a markup. And it's like, no, this is like, I started having to rewrite the tag where it said like HD factory surcharge. Cause it's like, no, we're not making any money off the surcharge. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> MSRP this year with the bigger gray, $20,199. Uh, in the 23 model year it was 18,199 plus the surcharge, plus the ABS, plus the traction control. So yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's relatively unchanged uh, in this new model year. But we thought, too, you know, now that we've got those couple things out of the way, which I think are going to be hot topics, so I wanted to cover them this episode here. But let's talk a little bit about the Lowrider S here. So the Lowrider S first came out in halfway through the 2016 model year, and it was a runaway hit right away. You know, it was launched on the Dyna platform back when we had the Dyna. And up until that point, the Dyna platform was really gaining popularity as, you know, a club style bike that a lot of the younger guys wanted, especially guys moving from uh, the motocross world were coming into the Harley world. And that was their, their bike of choice, right? And Harley Davidson blacked it all out. They gave it the, the 110 cubic inch motor, which is the biggest twin cam motor available from the factory at the time. So it was very much a performance-driven, you know, Dyna with the blacked-out styling that was very popular in that crowd. And so that ran halfway through the 16 model year and the 17 model year. 
And then in the 18 model year, that's when we saw the new Softail chassis that combined both the Dyna and the Softail families into one common frame, right? In the new Softail frame. And we didn't see a Lowrider S in that model year, the 18 or the 19 model year, the Lowrider S was gone. We saw the Fat Bob. The Fat Bob kind of stepped in as that performance cruiser model. Had a little bit bigger displacement in the motor, inverted front end, dual disc brakes, things like that. And then in the 20 model year, that's when we saw the reintroduction of the Lowrider S on this new soft tail chassis with the Milwaukee 8. And it had a 114 from the factory. Nick actually purchased one in the 21 model year. It had the Midnight Crimson. And I actually had an 18 soft tail uh, low rider as well that we had blacked out and done like a stage kit on and everything. So and at that point, actually, when I got my low rider, this was my third of the new soft tail family of uh, bikes, which is pretty cool. So I've got a lot of experience on the soft tails in general and, and experience with the low rider um, S. And then I think we mentioned, but in the 22 model year, so the, the model year immediately after I purchased my Midnight Crimson in 21, there was further revision. So, and that's kind of brings us up to where the bike currently sits, uh, which is it now has the 117 cubic inch engine. It had the, or it has the taller uh, shock, the soft tails come in one of two configurations when it comes to rear suspension. This now has the taller rear suspension, which is a common mod anyways. Um, I had raised the rear suspension on my Lowrider S because I wanted more ground clearance. I wanted better uh, ride comfort and uh, I wanted more lean angle. So easiest way to do that was with a taller shock. Now you get that from the factory. I had to add cruise control to mine. That was something that became standard in 22. Uh, so you now you don't have to add cruise control, which is really nice because it's not the cheapest thing in the world to do either part or labor. So it's really nice to have that as uh, in included. Um, and then they went to a single gauge. Um, so the low riders historically have had a twin gauge set up on the gas tank. They moved away from that to a more performance uh, uh, gauge setup. In my opinion, you've got a center single gauge that is primarily a tachometer. It's very similar to the one that's on the fat bob. And then you have a digital readout for your speedometer. So it's kind of a racy setup, you know, to have, uh, you know, your primary uh, focus of your, your gauge to be your, your tack, you know, because all, all you got to know is you're going fast, but you need to know where your engine RPM is, right? So that's right. That's where your priority has to be, but still a five gallon tank. And the new console is really nice too. It's very similar to the one on the, on the breakout. It's low profile. It's a nice wrinkle finish with a, with a cool FX LRS uh, logo on it. Um, and then the offset gas cap, like you have on a, on a bagger. And it's no longer symmetrical too. My, my little rider had the symmetrical gas caps with the dummy on the left side. Yeah. Like Nick mentioned in the 22 model year, you know, one of their big themes was further and faster. And that's when they came out with the ST models, the road glide, the street glide. And then also that was the introduction of the low rider ST as well. And so during that whole ST movement that Harley Davidson, kind of their big flagship description of the whole model year, that's when they added all these changes that Nick just mentioned to the, the low rider S. There was another um, change I didn't mention, which is uh, traction control became an option. Um, now we referenced it earlier, but- In 23 model year. In 23, yeah. So that's with the introduction of the breakout. The breakout had traction control, which I think was probably technically the first soft tail, but it was also optional on the uh, some of the other bikes in the soft tail line. It's not the same as the traction control on the baggers, uh, hence the lower price. It's a 200 or it was a $200 option. Um, I guess we're, we're still kind of figuring out if it is uh, an option this year, if it's just standard. So it's, it's not as advanced or as smart as that system uh, that's, that's the on RD the baggers. Yeah. Is, which is called the RDRS reflex defensive yeah. rider system. So unlike the baggers, the, the low rider S does not have a six axis IMU. And so what that means is the bike doesn't know how far leaned over it is. It doesn't know how hard it's decelerating and it doesn't know how hard it's accelerating. And so the traction control is basically just going to be using, uh, to my understanding, um, although I'm sure maybe an engineer can can correct me, um, it's just using the wheel speed sensors. And so if the wheel speed of the rear is dramatically faster than the front, it knows that the rear is spinning and it'll cut uh, power to the rear. Now that's a little less sophisticated than what's on the baggers. The baggers know if they're leaned over, so they know when you get on the throttle uh, what the available traction is and that it's going to be less. And it also means that the ABS on the bike, unlike an RDRS bike, is not any better than it was in the previous years just because it has traction control. So if you get the traction control option or you don't get it on your low rider, um, now it may not be an option anymore. But if, if you have a previous one, your ABS is the same performance level as, as it has always been on, on the soft tails. So it's not lean sensitive uh, like it would be on the baggers. So I would like to see them introduce that as an option. That'd be a really cool thing to, to have a full RDRS suite because obviously in addition to the safety features, I really like the tire pressure monitoring. Um, the hill holds nice as well. So 
there's other things in there and then the modes are nice you know having a rain mode being able to control the throttle a little bit and, and maybe even program a mode would be wonderful on the soft tails as long as they could you know implement it in a really clean tidy way but they've proven that they can on on some of the, like the the new RevMax sportster bikes so and the new cvos too have ride modes now too yeah so uh it should be it should be possible it, it would be cool a cool option to see but i was just really happy to see that on the uh, the, the traction control just in general well I, I think if you guys haven't noticed like the and if you don't already know the lowrider s is pretty much harley davidson's flagship performance cruiser you know, in the soft tail family. One of the things that it came out with in the 20 model year when it was reintroduced on the soft tail chassis was the inverted front end as well, which not all the soft tails have the inverted front end at this point. And, you know, dual disc brakes, I think we already mentioned that. But, you know, it's got the braking, it's got the power, and it's been one of the most popular bikes uh, that Harley Davidson has ever made, in my opinion. I mean, those things just continue to sell you know, consistently to a very broad consumer base. You know, you got everything from the young kid that rides dirt bikes on the weekend to the 55, 60 year old that just likes a hot rod in a mid-sized cruiser bike. And so it just, it appeals to, to a lot of people on a grand scale. It's very much a sweet spot bike, you know, in a lot of ways. It's a little bit like the Pan Am in terms of, uh, but like almost like a cruiser version of it. I know I'm, I'm annoying. I'm comparing everything to the Pan America, but. Um, that's, what, that's what he rides if you guys didn't know. Yeah. Um, the, the cool thing about the Lowrider S is that it does everything pretty darn well. You know, it's not as light and narrow and small as a Sportster, but it, uh, and it's not as touring focused as a bagger, but you are getting a six speed transmission. You're getting the big twin, right? Uh, the Milwaukee eight and you're getting, and the, now you're getting the biggest big twin outside of a CVO. 117. You're getting trash control. You're getting a five gallon tank. You're getting really competent suspension. You're getting a lot of bang for the buck as well. Cause when you think about the price point that you can get into a big twin is somewhere around 16 grand. You know, if you're doing a standard, maybe a little bit lower, but if you want a street Bob, you know, 16, 17 grand, depending on how it's optioned for not that much more, you're getting inverted front suspension on the, on the rider rest. You're getting, like I mentioned, the cruise control standard, you're getting everything blacked out, um, which is something that historically hasn't always just come for free on bikes. You're getting a five gallon tank over the street, Bob, you're getting taller rear suspension. So you don't have to necessarily add that. There's a lot of stuff in the, both the aftermarket and the PNA world that then you can morph it to fit your role. You know, uh, I've taken a lot of trips on the bike, you know, I, we went to death Valley, Yosemite on my low rider S, but you can also commute on them. The bags from Harley are pretty much all quick detach, which means if you want to have a really narrow, quick, uh, you know, commuter for splitting lanes, it's perfect for that. So as you mentioned, it's just, it does a lot of things. Well, it checks a lot of boxes and it does it for a price point, which is it's premium. It's a Harley. The fit and finish is gorgeous, but compared to a bagger, if you want a special or something that you want a blacked out bagger with the same size motor, you're going to easily be spending 10 grand more than what you would on a little yeah. RS. Yeah, good point. And I think it's very telling if we were to take inventory of all the bikes that we've heavily modified in the last three years. Lowrider S is one of those bikes that when people want to modify their bike and go all in on, on a on over the top build, that's like a show worthy build. Lowrider S has been the go-to bike in that family. And then like Rogue Glide has been a go-to bike in terms of, you know, when people come in and they want to spend 10, 20, 30, sometimes $60,000 on their bike. Those are really the, the two bikes where people spend the most money. And so to Nick's point, you can really build that bike out to be a lot of different things. Uh, it's just a good base bike for, and I, I use the, the word base lightly, uh, because really it's a lot better than like a base bike. When I think of uh, just kind of your bare bones soft tail, the bike in, in the lineup that can be classified as that is the soft tail standard. And, you know, Nick kind of gave us the perfect segue into the bikes that we would probably compare to the Lowrider S. If you're shopping for a new bike and you think that this is the bike for you, you know, we always like to educate people as to what bikes they should also be looking at to maybe make sure that Lowrider S is in fact the right bike for them. Nick mentioned the Street Bob. So the Street Bob, you're saving a little bit of money, a couple thousand bucks, I think, off the top of my head. You're getting the 114, so three cubic inches less. You have a passenger seat on that bike, although the passenger seat's probably good for about 20 minutes. And then you're also buying a different style. You know, the street bob you're buying, more of a bobber style, that grunge, mini ape hanger look, you know, something that was looks like maybe it was built out of a garage, but it's obviously a modern day brand new Harley Davidson. And so a little bit different style. No and cruise control, shorter shock in the rear as smaller well. Smaller fuel tank. Smaller fuel tank. Yeah. But the shorter shock, I mean, some guys may want the shorter look of the bike or maybe they 
are shorter inseam. They want to have a shorter shock, but nine times out of 10, I, I think if you can touch with a taller shock, you're going to have just a lot better ride comfort. Yeah. The street bob just for a whole host of reasons, I'd say most notably the gas tank, um, but also the lack of cruise control and the shorter shock is just a slightly less versatile bike, you know? Yeah. I, I will say, Nick, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, a lot of people are really big on the gas tank. Like they just think that automatically the three and a half gas tank, it just isn't good as the five gallon. Yeah. And I would say, you know, depending on your riding, that may or may not be the case. You know, for some guys that are around town, do a lot of local stuff and don't put big mileage every day on their bike, the three and a half delivers a, a look that's more a bobber, more in line with the style that bike's going for. And you're still going to get, you know, well over 100 miles range on that bike. But yeah, if you're a guy that's going to be stacking miles, then yeah, that's probably not the best fuel tank for you. But it's yeah. not always a bad thing. No, and know? and if like I, like you mentioned, it, it fits the style of the bike. It really highlights the motor. You know, the Milwaukee Eight has uh, just a beautiful set of cylinder heads. And when you have the five gallon tank, or especially like the six gallon tank on the baggers, uh, not the new CVO one, but uh, the previous generation, the motor gets hidden quite a bit more by the gas tank. And to be honest, you know, we we do some pretty serious miles in a, in a day, but Rarely do we want to do more than 100, 120 miles a stretch if we can avoid it. You know, for the most part, that's a pretty good stopping point. Um, so, and a you, lot of guys don't ride out of state like we do. No, you know, and a lot of guys they want it for around town, and they're not going to do. You know, uh, and there's very few sections of our trip where a street bob wouldn't have made it anyways. Yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah you, you might be a little bit. Uh, you know, you might you might have the little fuel icon on, but you'd still probably make it on most of our our stints. So it, you know, yeah. as long as you know it, it's easy enough to ride around it. It's not that big a deal. I think it gets overblown. I just think that uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that's it's a number and it's easy to focus on, but it's it's less yeah. important. But who knows? Uh, we don't know anything about the twenty four street bob. So true. Yeah, um, we haven't seen the twenty four. What we're bob comparing yet. against it, it could change. You know, yeah, good who point. knows? Good yeah. point. I think the other bike that people are going to really compare to the Lowrider S is the Lowrider ST. For many of you that follow Harley Davidson know that in the 22 model year, like we mentioned, they came out with the Lowrider ST, which is a bike that here at Laidlaws, we've kind of been asking for, for probably about four or five years now. It's basically a bike that took its inspiration from the FXRT, the, the Sport Glide back that came out uh, in the 80s and now modernized the fairing and they put bags on there. And it's more of your your touring focused lowrider, and so it's been an absolute hit. By the way, you know, up until recently, the last probably two years, we've been completely sold out. We have some on the floor now. It's in, in a nutshell. If you're looking for something that has storage and it has a fairing on it, that's going to be better for long hauls out on the freeway, high speed, long duration riding. Then the lowrider ST is going to be the bike for you. Um, and that's kind of over oversimplified, but it's obvious by looking at it, you know, what the distinction is between the two, you know, obviously the Lowrider S is, is a little bit more cut down and then the Lowrider ST already has more of a direction for that bike chosen. You know, yeah, it's, true. it's got a larger fairing on it. It's got the optional sound equipment that you can uh, just kind of drop in there. Uh, it's got saddlebags from the factory, which are really nice. Probably going to offer more space than pretty much anything else that you could put onto that bike uh, from the aftermarket. And so it's it's kind of got its direction chosen a little bit more than the Lowrider uh, S does. The ST is, it's T for touring. So it's definitely focused in that direction. Can, you're not going to want to buy the Lowrider ST and take the fairing off. You no. Know, if you buy that bike, you're going to exactly. you want that fairing. You, you might run it without the saddlebags here or there. But, uh, which even are quick then, detach. You can take them yeah. off easily. Uh, but even then, you know, most time I see those bikes, uh, guys running around, they leave the saddlebags on because you know it's hard to go back to not having saddlebags once you've had saddlebags. You like, put stuff in there and like gloves and stuff. And yeah. you, don't, you never take it out. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I'm never taking the tank bag off my my bike. I'm never taking my tail bag off. You know, at a certain point, like I need luggage. I've gotten used to having luggage. I need luggage. I'm not going back to the no luggage life. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about an MSRP this year for the Lowrider ST at twenty three five ninety nine. So you're at thirty four hundred dollars more than the Lowrider S. And again, if you're not into the fairing style or whatever, for $3,400, you can make some pretty good changes to the Lowrider S. So yeah. you have to just really ask yourself, you know, what you're going to use the bike for. And if you like that style of the fairing, uh, I think Harley Davidson knocked it out of the park on the fairing of the Lowrider ST. And I don't want to jump into that too much because we're going to be talking about the Lowrider ST here pretty soon. We did get a 24 model year Lowrider ST in the Vivid Black as well, which we'll probably be reviewing in the near future. No significant changes mechanically this year, but again, a, a bike that has sold so many units since the 22 model year when it was released that it's it's become 
you know, one of the core bikes in Harley Davidson's lineup. Uh, while the, the two bikes are very similar and obviously we'll, we'll talk more about the Lowrider ST in its own, own review. Um, I think one of the things I want to talk about in this review and it'll apply to that is just kind of the underpinnings, the bones of the bike. You know, we've, we've done deep dives into the soft tail frame, um, in, in the past, but it's something that I, I find myself continually reiterating is that this is not the soft tail that you knew in the past and the associations that you had with that name um, really shouldn't be tied to this bike because the capabilities are vastly different. You know, I'm uh, in the process of editing a FXR review right now. Um, and you know, it was a very capable platform. The new soft tail is far more capable than the old dyno when it comes to touring and that kind of stuff. You're not restricted in what you can really do. You're going to get marginal incremental benefit from going to the touring frame. If you are someone who rides two up a lot, or if you do a lot a lot of highway riding um or you are very very tall in stature but if you're someone who's between the height of you know five seven and maybe six foot or six one even uh, if you go to like the forwards you can make the low rider s extremely comfortable for you you can tour on it you can do whatever you really want on that bike you will not feel limited by the the chassis um because it is uh, Harley's most modern chassis, and in my opinion, it's one of their most capable. Uh, it, certainly, it's the most versatile of the the cruiser uh, chassis currently. Yeah, even though I prefer the touring chassis, I I think that the soft tail chassis is a better chassis all around for what its intended purpose. You know, it's just newer, tighter. Uh, the suspension is better. You know, a lot of people would argue, and I kind of agree, that the stock suspension on a soft tail is better than the stock suspension on a touring chassis, especially the lowered shock on a touring bike. Like yeah. that, that comes on the majority of the bikes that get bought, yeah. the street glide and the road glides. Those have the lowered touring shock on there. And the shocks on the soft tail chassis are just, they're better going down the highway. Especially um, the taller one on the, on the low rider S now. You know, it, it's got nearly double the travel of one of the lowered baggers. So yeah. it's just a physics problem in a certain point. You know, it's going to ride nicer uh, than those bikes are just because it's got double the, the amount of room to absorb bumps. Yeah, definitely. So we thought we would touch on accessories real quick. One of the things I like to include in these videos is you know, what accessories are available for bikes. And I usually like to focus on, on Harley Davidson genuine accessories because I think a lot of times people, when they buy a bike, they don't always know exactly uh, the ease or what's available of accessorization. You know, for example, like uh, something with a wide fat tire in the soft tail family, like a breakout or a fat boy, you know, you don't have as many options in terms of like bags and sissy bars uh, and things like that, you know, like creature comforts that something that like a lowrider s does so nick did a little bit of research before this video and he found some of the most popular most likely items to be bought by someone that buys a lowrider s and so he's going to touch on those real quick yeah i mean i think one of the go-to ones is something we've talked a little bit about but that's going to be storage since this bike is so capable on the highway you know you're going to be tempted to go out with your buddies on you know overnighters and stuff they have a really nice uh soft bag it's uh, the overwatch luggage it's quick detach just like it is uh for the st hard bags you can also get the st hard bags um as well but they're quite a bit pricier the overwatch bags to my recollection are mid 700s you know and the hardware to put them on not going to be that much more so and these are these are the bags that are similar to like uh the they look kind of like a pros. t-sport yeah they kind of look like an old t-sport bag right yeah. leather pros is a soft. common one um, that would be making that but yeah it's a soft ballistic nylon with a, a leather flap on top um they're not lockable uh without kind of like you know uh, luggage locks or something like that but they are quite waterproof everything in the overwatch lineup has has been you know engineered to be weather resistant and they fit perfectly you don't have to remove the the turn signals which means that that getting them on um, your bike is even cheaper. You're not trying to do, you know, a turn signal delete or something like that, or, uh, you know, doing anything wonky. So location. Exactly. Um, and another thing, it would be uh, fairings. Harley has a quarter fairing, uh, which is something I had on my 21 Lowrider S. It's something that I had on my uh, 18 Lowrider. They are wonderful for uh, especially guys in my height range. So, you know, somewhere between 5'8 and 5'11". And you're going to get a lot of a lot of performance out of that for a lot less than you would spend on on a larger you know FXR T style fairing, and you can get both of those items and still be you know fifteen hundred bucks less than what a, a low rider ST would 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 run you. I think it's um, important to point out to though Nick, even though you do get a, quite a bit of benefit from those, you're still not going to get as much benefit than uh, you would 
having a lowrider ST fairing. Oh, you yeah, know, definitely. Obvi obviously, it's a lot bigger on the mm -hmm. lowrider ST. You can also put the stereo for $1,000 as an extra parts and accessory item. So you, you now have sound, which there's yeah. not a really good solution for the quarter fairing for sound. But nothing as elegant as what Harley has and nothing uh, going to be as seamlessly integrated as what Harley has with the lowrider ST. But, you know, there's some guys that don't like the look of a fairing. You know, they don't like the big look. You know, they want a Road King special or they because they don't like the, the fairing on the baggers or they want the lowrider S because they don't like the fairing on the ST, but they start doing rides with their buddies and they want more wind protection with the, the little uh, uh, bullet fairing on there, the little uh, bikini fairing on the bike. Uh, provides from the right. factory so those are really nice options a lot of the stuff i had to add to my bike i didn't have to add so normally i would be listing things like uh, cruise control you don't have to add it this time the uh, taller shock already comes from the factory so a lot of the stuff that previously we would talk about with modifying low rider s's kind of comes on there you know now yeah. it's it's really just kind of uh, ergonomic stuff they do of course yeah. still have their uh, forward control kit like what's on the the fat bob i think ergonomics wise it's really nice even for guys that are not super tall like i can very comfortably reach those you don't lose a lot of lean angle the bike has i believe uh nearly 30 degrees of lean from the factory if you go to the forward controls with the fat bob uh, pegs you're not going to really lose anything so there's a lot of great options but primarily the things i tend to focus on are going to be things that let you go further or be more comfortable uh, there's great sissy bar options, tail bags from the factory, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so. Seats. I'm, I'm not a, a fan of the stock seat on no. the Lowrider no. S or Lowrider ST. So there are seat options as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, Harley has a couple of handlebar options. We do a lot of aftermarket bars here as well. Yeah. You know, a, a nice T-bar on a Lowrider S is something that I think a lot of a lot of people like. And there's a lot of options too now for gauge relocations, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the sky is the limit. You know, there's so many different options for handlebars. It's kind of hard to do a recommendation. Right. And it's going to be so uh, user specific. All right, guys. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for the 24 model year Lowrider S. Like I said, we'll be talking about the ST here in the near future. But um, other than colors and you know some pricing things that we mentioned, we have the same Lowrider S that we that we saw kind of with a a, a pretty good sizable redesign in the 22 model year it's now back for the 24 model year so thanks a lot for watching guys and if you're looking for a bike in southern california make sure you hit us up here at laid laws harley davidson and if you haven't already make sure you hit that subscribe button and like the video and we'll see you on the next one thanks a lot guys see ya.